When I was a kid and dinner time was approaching, I quickly learned, and my mom also affirmed, the best way you can help today, Adam, stay out of the way. <laughs> Ever said those words to your kids? Anybody? Only me. Okay. <laughs> Only me. Or, or to your wife or to somebody else you're working on a project with or whatever, like just, just step out of the way and I'll take care of it. We'll just, that's the best way to make sure that everything's taken care of. Uh, I mean, essentially, my mom was saying, uh, if you want everybody to get fed, including you, stay out of the way. In a surprising, upside-down kingdom of God that we are in the opposite is what we hear today. If you want everyone to get their fill at the feast that he is serving, including you, get in the way. That's what John the baptizer was. It was just read just a minute ago. He's the forerunner of Jesus. and He proclaimed this, get in the way. His message is our next stop here in the Advent season. A uh, season where we are slowing down, intentionally uh, reflecting, waiting, so that we can clearly see what's in front of us presently. If you were with us uh, last week, Pastor Brian did a great job of helping lead us through uh, seeing the reality that the waiting really is a good thing, because it helps us see which things matter and which ones don't. I encourage you to go back and listen to that on our YouTube page or the podcast if you didn't catch that last week. At this stop, we get to dwell, we get to pause, we get to reflect on the words that God delivered through John the Baptist. Now, that's not like Southern Baptist Convention uh, Baptist, but rather he was the guy who did lots of baptizing. So John the Baptizer, the original Baptist. Anyways, uh, and he says, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight. The rough ways smooth. And all mankind will see God's salvation. If the way is prepared, all will see. Now, for those of you for which this text is old hat, you've heard these things before, can I just speak to you for a moment, and for those of you that it's new or, or novel or something like that, just, just give me a sec. Let me talk to them first. Um, maybe it's hard to stop here, to be patient here. In, in this text in particular, it's always hard to stop and to be patient anyway, but maybe in this one in particular, because we know that John the baptizer is just an appetizer for the meal that is to come. The main course. And in fact, that main course actually has already been served. You know that Jesus has come, that he's already prepared the path, and that he has walked on it effectively for our good and to bring us salvation. Maybe you've even gone as far as studying the baptism that John offered. He says it's the baptism for repentance of sins. And you know and you've received and understand that this one is essentially obsolete. We're not doing that anymore. It's a historical fact back in history for sure, but we don't do baptisms for repentance anymore, not like that at least, because we have a baptism that's not merely symbolic of a posture of openness to a new era that's coming, which is what John was inviting them to. Uh, we have a baptism that's not merely a willingness to submit ourselves to an authority outside of ourselves, which was part of that as well. We have a baptism that delivers the forgiveness of sins, that delivers the Holy Spirit through Jesus, that gives us eternal life and salvation. So why stop here? What's to gain? What's to see as we slow down and reflect this week? What's right in front of us that we need to see presently? I encourage you that there is. And let me speak to, to all of you together to these prudent questions that have been brought up. Let me address uh, both. Let me help you frame this in a way that helps you avoid tuning out in the next uh, few minutes as we walk through this together. Since on one hand... Past and future, Jesus has come, lived, died, rose again, ascended, and is coming back. And then on the other hand, in the present here, he's also presently coming to us through his word, through the sacrament we'll receive today, through the delivery of, of his good news and his spirit in baptism. He comes to us even now. He comes to us as the spirit works among us and between us, wherever two or three are gathered, there he is with us. Therefore, the best question for today is not, are you prepared for when he comes? But are you receiving him? And if so, how? And if you're so confident of that, how do you know? 
These are questions you should be able to answer if you are receiving it. And actually, if you pause this for a second, consider it. Regardless of whether the coming of Jesus is an imminent coming thing like John was talking about in his day, or it's something that's happened presently, happening presently now, the posture of well prepared to receive is no different. And in fact, since he's coming presently for us now, it's even more important that we were already ready to be receiving him. So let's not too quickly or confidently move past these things. Not only because of that, but also because as you look at the original hearers of these words, the one to whom uh, John was proclaiming initially, they too were ones that were confident. They're like, yeah, 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 John, I don't need this. I'm good without this. They didn't think they needed what God had given to John to share with them. We're not going to fall into the same error today. So let's join in prayer, and then we'll dig into it together. Pray with me. Uh, Father in heaven, we know that all of your word is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. You gave these words to the writers, inspiring their minds and prompting them to record them. And we know that all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So Father, we pray. Give us trust in this promise and in you enough that you lead us to be open to how you'll work through your word today to equip us for the good works you've prepared to accomplish through us. We do want all people to get fed. In Jesus' name we pray, we agree and say together, amen. So the question before us, are you receiving him and are you prepared so that you can? This is what uh, John is asking those who are willing to hear him. So let's take a look together. If you want to get out your Bible, we're in Luke chapter 3, uh, digital version, paper version in front of you there, uh, Luke chapter 3. Um, as you're getting there, I'll, I'll talk about the, uh, the words right at the beginning there that kind of lock us into the historical place for that. Sean, where are you now? Sean Smith, thank you uh, for uh, being the sacrificial lamb up here to have to read all the places and names. God bless you. Uh, <laughs> So anyways, uh, Luke initially locks this in a historical place. Uh, I want you to know the ruler in this place, the ruler in that place, what time has happened, so that anybody who looked back on it later, and to the original hearers um, that would heard this, like, this is where it began. If you want to know where the story starts, you can find it from these other places and connect it together. And in that place... During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert... And he went in all the country around the Jordan, preaching this, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And in order to preach a baptism of of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, he used words that the prophet Isaiah had originally spoken 700 years previously. So God inspired Isaiah to write these things down. You can find them uh, in Isaiah if you look back there and check the cross references uh, in in your Bible there. And he says these words, uh, quoting Isaiah, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked roads made straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. Like I said before, this isn't a get out of the way, though it sort of sounds that way, like get out of the way so the big equipment can come in and smooth this out and grade things down and straighten the road, but the original hearers would not have heard that at all. And if we're going to be uh, faithful interpreters of God's word, our first task is to hear what the original hearers heard so that we can apply it to our day based on what they actually heard, not what we hear. So let's understand what they heard. When they hear this word, prepare the way, they basically heard get in the way. Now, now that doesn't mean like like stand in front of Jesus and and be the lead blocker, but rather uh, it is uh, go get in the same way that he is walking. They'd have heard get in the ways of God because this is uh, in line with Old Testament scripture, not only because John looks like a sort of Hagrid guy, maybe like Hagrid, I don't know, um, uh, out uh, in the desert, big beard, uh, you know, uh, old uh, like robes, kind of rough looking guy, ate uh, locust and honey. Um, He was just a a rough dude out there in the desert, similar to the prophets of the Old Testament. So he looked like them. 
sounded like them, coming from the wilderness, which is the place that salvation often came from throughout the history of Old Testament. And he's proclaiming the words of an Old Testament prophet. So all these things help them hear Old Testament, look to the back, to look to, to what was said before to understand what's being said in the present. And also because the words, the way, were code language. No, not like secret code language, but uh, common knowledge shorthand for the way of the Lord. Let me give you some for instances. Uh, Psalm 1, verse 6, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Uh, the right path is set out by God, essentially, of the way of life, like the psalm says. Uh, it was in the absolution that we heard just a minute ago that it says those that are walking in this way, they're like the tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. And then it compares to the, the other way, the, the wicked way, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. So we see that, that word the way being used in the, the poetic literature. You see it in the Proverbs as well. You see it in the historic literature of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy. Remember the way that Yahweh, your God, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness? Keep his commandments uh, by walking in his ways and fearing him. Now, if you really want to get technical on this, um, the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, portions in Aramaic. Uh, the New Testament's written in Greek. And there was a time when Greek speakers wanted a Bible that was all Greek, and so they translated the Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek, so you had an entire Greek Bible. So the same word that's translated the way in the New Testament is translated with the same words where they talk about the way in the Old Testament. So there is this parallel, uh, the same word uh, being in used in both places. Places. Thankfully, in English, you, it does the same thing. The translators have done a great job, so we too can see these parallel things happening. And I just want to confirm for you, they're talking about the same thing. The same word is used and the same ideas are behind it. Even as you look into Acts, the followers of Jesus in Acts chapter 9, when they first identified as a grouping of people, they are called followers of the way. Even when John's dad, Zechariah, who sung a song at his birth, proclaimed who John would be and the purpose of his life, he said, and you, my child, you will be called a prophet of the Most High. You will go on before the Lord and to prepare the way for him. And he actually goes on to say, which, which helps us understand where this way leads. He says, it's, it's to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in the darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the paths of peace. It's a way that leads to salvation, to light in the darkness and to peace. And so John is calling out to these people from the wilderness, get in the way. Now, I also want you to hear, as, as he says these words, uh, it's not the way, like, this is the right way, and this is the wrong way, and there's two different paths that you could be on. Uh, what would have been hear, heard then, uh, with the, the way that the rabbis would talk about it, is that there is only one way, and you're either going this way, or you're going this way. You're either faced in the right direction or faced in the wrong one. So actually, I think it's even more helpful to think of it not as a road, but more like an open field where, where God's standing in the middle of it. And, and you, might be, uh, you might be relatively close to him and faced in the wrong direction, or you might be a really long ways away from him, but faced in the right direction. And so to be on the way, to be in the way is to be directed in the right direction and moving in the right direction, even if you're a long ways away from him. It's the same. It's a about orientation and positioning. And as he says this, as this comes to mind and as he hears these words, as they say these words, the prepare the way, he's speaking to many who are already confident that they were in the way, that they were in the right direction. And he calls them to self-reflection and works to kick out their false Foundations, And so as we strive to, to hear these words ourselves, uh, it'd be wise for us to consider as well whether we are falsely confident 
and what might be the false foundations that we stand on. Luke uh, chapter 3, the the second half of verse 8, he says it this way, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Uh, That was one of the places of confidence that they had because we've got the right name. We are already in because we've been in the family that's always been in and that's how you get in. We are children of the promise. Uh, Actually, even before this, if you go back a couple verses to verse seven, as he goes to address them initially, he's already prepared for their rebuttal, for their pushing back, these words that he put in their mouths, like don't even try to make this argument, guys, because he calls them, hey, you brood of vipers, which is essentially like you family of snakes. You, uh, those who are uh, sons of serpents, um, I don't know if you could, it's probably a stretch on the text to say that he's calling them sons of Satan uh, here, but certainly he's saying that the road walked in this direction leads there, and the judgment is coming, so be careful. The point altogether, associations, whether familial or, or, or formal, and words, they won't cut it. It's actions that count. If you're in the way, then prove it. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The way spoken of all throughout Scripture leads somewhere. When you're faced toward God, receiving what He gives, walking toward Him, it does lead to fruit. So the way, the way is not just a path, it is a way of life which forms you in particular ways and has a particular end product. So I actually think an an even better question than this, rather than are you receiving him or are you prepared so that you can, more pointedly, at least as it hits my heart, is to ask the question of what the pattern of your life is producing. If there was a sentence to write down to reflect on over the course of the week, it would be this. What is the pattern of my life producing? And note, not the intentions of your life, not the hopes of your life, not the ideals or the dreams of your life, but your current pattern of life. It's producing something. What is it? It's shaping you somehow. What's happening? Are you walking in the ways of this world? Which way are you facing? Which way are you moving? Uh, Let's take right where we're at right now. In uh, preparation for Christmas, To what extent have you been sucked into the ways of the world, a way which is uh, molded by marketing so that we salivate at sales, so that we amass the amounts of gifts that are enough for the eyes of the openers, a way in which, in consuming, we are consumed? As you put up the tree and the tinsel, as you pull out the lights and the manger, do they shape you toward being satisfied? or longing? Do they remind you of how much you have and how good your God is, or rekindle one more frustration of what isn't yet, what you wish were there? Don't get me wrong, I love all those preparations, but but what do they produce? If they help you get focused on Jesus and taking steps toward Him, great, but do they? Getting in the way John says, is done through repentance. So maybe just as much time to put up the tree and set out the things and buy the gifts would be time set aside, maybe as important and prioritized as much as those things, time to set aside to repent, which probably starts with a long, hard look at the past year and saying, what has my life produced? In what way am I moving toward the ways of Jesus? Do I see myself trending toward a longing to give versus a longing to get? Where do I expect my peace to come from? In the past, how have I found myself to to, to find freedom, to find hope in this life? Where do I expect the fullness of life to come? Like those in the crowd who had confidence in their bloodline, who were reluctant to receive the way as described by the one by God that was given to them, to help them prepare their hearts to usher in this new era that was about to dawn, it would be wise for us to consider, are there ways that God has led us to prepare, suggested maybe by the ones that God has given to proclaim God's words to you, 
that you likewise don't need. That your reluctance to receive the encouragement toward a daily reading of God's word, toward a a life of prayer without ceasing, toward Christian friends that, that challenge and exhort to whom you can be open with and confess to. If not worth asking, uh, what are you reading and how is it forming you? Because it is. Where do you look for strength and direction? If not in the Holy Spirit and his power, it's probably to yourself. And that's certainly setting your direction. Are, who are you allowing to challenge you? Anyone? If there is anyone, is there anyone that you're open with? who knows what's happening behind the doors of your house, behind the thoughts of your mind. If no one, know that this too will form you. (laughs) Initially cement you in uh, where you are, which starts out feeling like a, a beautifully protective fortress where I don't have to admit my pain or share my shame or deal with the embarrassment of what is. But I assure you that what starts out as protection ends up like prison. John was proclaiming freedom to those who didn't know they had built their own prisons. This is my goal for you today. John was aggressive, abrupt, uncompromisingly determined to proclaim the good news that so many were convinced that they didn't need to hear. They were convinced that they were in the way and were unwilling to consider that their way wasn't producing the fruit that abiding with Jesus does, that that leads all people to see the salvation of God. Now, for them, it was uh, my connection to Abraham, and I don't know uh, of any. There probably are some, uh, maybe some in the American churches that have find their confidence and are so certain because they find Abraham as their father. They're in that bloodline. I don't know too many that way, but I know of far too many that are unwilling to do anything different than what their fathers and mothers did. We go to church. We pray at meals. We get our kids confirmed. We go to Bible class. We do enough so that they will do for the next generation what we've done for them. But the rest of the time's ours. The rest of the energy is ours. That's, that's the limit. I know that's been my experience. And one that little by little, I feel Jesus prompting me to repent from. You? Because this isn't God's picture of the way. His is a way that governs the whole of our minutes, our hours, and our days, a way that teaches and reasserts by its design what is valuable, a way that is daily immersed in his word that's constantly in prayer, that's woven with accountability and encouragement and open communication with other Christians so that he, by his spirit, wherever two or three are gathered, can lead you to abide in him so that you can bear much fruit so that more and more you are formed so that the wants and the ways and the will of Jesus are your wants and your ways and your will. And it's not going to happen by getting out of the way. That's not his plan. He invites, he commands, get in the way. Get turned in the right direction. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So if you're wondering what it is, it is the way that's, that's led by Jesus. He says, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Get in step with me. And this first step is always prayer that our first steps would be together. And realize that the fruit that he expects, it's not some other life than what you're living It's not in a long, distant place from where you are. Remember we talked about it? It doesn't matter whether you're standing here or way over there. I mean, as he meets the people that that hear this word initially, he says, it's simple, right, right where you're at. If you've got two cloaks, you see someone that has none, share it. If you've got extra food, share it with those who don't have it. You don't have to go somewhere else. If you're a tax collector, just be straight and honest 
Do what you're supposed to do. Don't, don't overimpose. If you're, if you're a soldier, don't exhort. Don't, don't extort people. Don't, don't use your position in a way that takes advantage of other people. Just be where you are in a way that's honest to the way that God leads you. Let God move you to repent right where you are. Maybe just a little move, a little bit further this way, because small little course corrections will matter. I, I read a little thing the other day that said, if you lose a little bit more than a tenth of a pound every day this next year, you'll lose 40 pounds over the course of the year. Little corrections at a time. Where is God leading you today in a world filled with everything new, shiny, and attractive? Jesus invites, abide in me. Get in the way that has always been and always will be the way, the old, well-worn road, a road that Jesus walked ahead of you, sprinkled with his blood, died on the cross in your place, rose again from the dead, and ascended to be the ruling king. He did everything so that he could pave this way. It's been set for you so that you could walk in it. So now through John again today, he invites us, get in the way, come walk in it, so that not only you, but all people can join you in it. Let me wrap up here with just four lines from the songwriter Andrew Peterson that I think says this more poetically than I ever could. He says, go back, go back to the ancient paths. Lash your heart to the ancient mast and hold on, boy, whatever you do to the hope that's taken hold of you. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life for you, for all the world. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.